Barely two months ago, Ontario introduced a PharmaCare plan that covers everyone under 25. This week, the federal government tapped the now former Ontario Minister of Health, who implemented that plan, Eric Hoskins, to assess the feasibility of a national PharmaCare plan. Joining us now for what this augurs for getting such a program in place, Helen Stevenson, founder and CEO of Reformulary Group. She's also a former Assistant Deputy Minister of Health and Executive Officer of the Ontario Public Drugs Programs, and we're happy to have you back here at TVO. You're Thank you. You're becoming a familiar face, given <laughs> how newsworthy all this stuff still is. Well, let's just play a clip here from the Federal Finance Minister to get us started, as he made the announcement earlier this week. Sheldon. It's, in our estimation, just not acceptable that a significant subset of the population doesn't have access to pharmaceutical products. So we are looking at how we can solve for that problem. We've asked Eric Hoskins to take a look at it. He, of course, has a great deal of expertise, having managed the over $50 billion health care budget in Ontario. And we're going to find out how we can best approach this so that we consider the advantages of the current system that we have, the employer-type approach, which does provide many people with pharmaceutical as well as the places where we have gaps. Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau, let's start with that. What do you see as the benefits of having a former Ontario Minister of Health in this new role on this new task force? Well, he certainly, um, I mean, Eric Hoskins certainly has a lot of experience on the health file, not to mention he himself is a clinician, but also in the last, I guess it would be the last really um, almost year, for instance, that he brought forward OHIP Plus, for instance, which, which really has to do with coverage of drugs for under 25s in Ontario. Now, the last time you were here, we talked about the new OHIP Plus plan and the fact that you weren't all that keen on it. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you the same question again. Given that he put forward mm -hmm. a model for Ontario-style pharmacare, admittedly covering those 25 uh, under 25, do you still think he's the right guy for this job? Well, I do think he has he has a lot of passion, that's for sure, and he has at least a, a, a good, probably a solid understanding of the drug file and the pharmacare file. So um, I, one would think, I think, that he'd be well qualified to do it. In terms of putting a national pharmacare program in place, are there advantages to us here in the province of Ontario in as much as we already have something in place for under 25s that covers, I think, about 4,400 medications already. Mm -hmm. There would be an advantage because there's still a, a reasonable number of people, for instance, that don't have any coverage at all. So that could include people um, that may not be employed, for instance, and, and are not covered by the provincial plan or not, and obviously not covered by an employer plan, people that are self-employed, et cetera. So there still are people that wouldn't have any coverage of, of products and may be paying out of pocket. Uh, I want to be careful of the language here because I think the federal finance minister said Dr. Hoskins' job is to come up with a strategy as opposed to the nuts and bolts of an actual plan. Do you see a distinction in those two words? I, I do see a distinction. I think a strategy is a an approach. So looking at... Um, you know, what's the public policy around it? Who would we, who could we cover? What are the considerations, for instance? What are the considerations among their constituents, et cetera, as opposed to saying we're doing this and here's the timelines. Gotcha. Let's read this here from the Globe and Mail because uh, money, of course, is huge. Sheldon, bring this graphic up if you would. National Pharmacare could represent significant savings for both patients and the government. A parliamentary budget office analysis estimated that of the $28.5 billion dollars spent on prescription drugs in the year 2015, $24.6 billion would be eligible for coverage under a national pharmacare program, and that a true national prescription drug program would cost $20.2 billion. In other words, national pharmacare could represent a savings of roughly $4.2 billion annually. Let's start to pick that apart. First of all, do you believe that? Well, there are actually some updated numbers in terms of the forecast of what we spend. And the forecast that I've read recently out of the Canadian Institute for Health Information is that we spend $35 billion on prescription drugs among all of us. So all Canadians, including people out of pocket, et cetera. So $35 so, billion, not 28 and a half. Well, that's certainly so what more. was published even more. Huh. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So in which case, do you, do you believe there truly are more than $4 billion worth of savings to be had if we went to a national pharmacare program? 
Well, I, I, so I do believe there's maybe two quick pieces. I do believe there are savings to be had. I mean, I do believe, and there's a lot, certainly in, in the work that we do, we see a lot of opportunities around, I'll call it quote unquote waste. So in other words, taking more expensive drugs when there are less expensive drugs that work just as well. And sort of that idea of alternatives, for instance, that are options. There's a lot of opportunity there for savings. But from the savings themselves, there's also, if you were going to create one huge massive plan, for instance, there'd be a cost to do that. You need to build the infrastructure, you need to build an IT system, right, to capture all of that, enroll people, et cetera. So I think that's looking at the savings. I'm not sure, having looked at that report, I don't quite understand how, how the cost, let's say, of implementing it have been factored in. Uh, probably not up, to, up front, right? I mean, there'd be huge upfront costs and then maybe the savings come over time? I, I think that's fair, yes. Okay. What about the notion that if you have one purchaser of medication, the federal mm -hmm. government, for lack of a better expression, as opposed to sort of 10 provincial agencies that purchase, your, your bulk buying schlep, for lack of mm -hmm. a better word again, is uh, so fantastic that you can drive down costs that way. Is that true? That is true. And if I can just take a... a few seconds to go back. For instance, we did, um, when I was in the Ontario government doing big reforms of the system, when I when we first looked at the system, I mean, we weren't being a customer. We were just accepting the prices, for instance, that were being charged by pharmaceutical companies. And so one of the major, let's say, pieces of work that we did is exerting our buying power. So in Ontario at the time, it was a $4 billion budget. That's a significant customer in the country. And we started to negotiate agreements with manufacturers. So as a country, and let's maybe let's take the numbers from Kai High for their forecasts. Canadian Institute for Institute Health Information. Institute for Health Information, mm -hmm. exactly, and their, and their forecasts around the spend of $34 billion. There's, a, there's significant leverage in there, absolutely. So negotiators from whatever this federal agency ends up being can go to the drug companies and say, you want to be on our formulary, you're going to have to do way better than that. That happens? Uh, that certainly in Ontario, that some of the, in terms of trying to make drugs more what we call cost effective, that certainly could be a, a, an opportunity. So if they talk about savings of multiple billions of dollars, who at the end of the day is actually saving that money? Well, I think ultimately it's going to be the payer, so be it someone paying out of their pocket, for instance, although in National Pharmacare the idea is they're not going to be, or it's going to be the payer, meaning the province, for instance, or in the case of employer plans, it's maybe the employer then that's going to save money. And uh, sort of follow that along if you would. If there is a National Pharmacare plan in place, who actually funds it? Who, who pays the premiums for it? All that yeah. kind of stuff. That, that is probably the most important question on the mm -hmm. table right now is who would fund it. Um, and it really depends on how they def end up defining pharmacare, for instance, whether they define it as one big, let's blow up every single plan in the country and create one big one, in which case, is it the federal government that's going to pay for those that $35 billion worth of drugs? Or, for instance, if it's a plan, um, and I think Minister Morneau suggested to it, it's actually going to be a plan that would focus on covering people that have, don't have coverage. So, again, one would think that perhaps that's going to be something that the federal government, if they're developing the strategy, that they may um, then assume the cost of that as well. But if you're looking for bulk buying power, mm -hmm. presumably you have a lot more power. If you're, if you're the single purchaser, as opposed to just covering the people who aren't already covered. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Do you have, I mean, I, I assume at some point Eric Hoskins is going to sit down with you if he's in charge of this process now and ask for your advice on what kind of a thing they ought to roll out. So if he does, what, what would you tell him? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd tell him, let's say, I'd have a few pieces of advice. So one is, first of all, I think the approach of really looking at a plan that's going to cover people that don't have coverage, as opposed to really going in and changing, you know, and trying to create one big plan for people that already have a coverage. I don't yeah. think that, that's not really the public policy reason for doing this. It's for the people that don't have coverage. In other words, the opposite of what he did in Ontario. Um, sort of, he, yes. Sort of. He's picking up people that didn't have coverage, but he's picking up a lot of people that did have coverage. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I think, number one focus. Number two would be to really be looking at, so this idea of opportunities where there's alternatives. So the whole idea around behavior. And as Canadians, I think there's been historically, and again, we've seen it in the work we do, historically just people go to their, their physician, they take a prescription, they think it's the only drug to treat their condition. That's usually far from the truth. There's usually lots of alternatives, but how do you really, first of all, get the information in the hands of people? So we actually ourselves have a tool called Drug Finder that does that. But number two, it's how do you actually now motivate them to change their behavior? And that area of behavior change, I think, is critical in, in the area of 
PharmaCare, be it for this small group or be it for all plans. The finance minister, Bill Morneau, did say in his statement that he wants Eric Hoskins not only to do this job, but to make a recommendation at the end of the day that is, you know, fiscally mm -hmm. responsible. Does that suggest to you that he's not going to go for the whole $38 billion, we're going to cover absolutely everything, but rather just go for those who aren't covered now? It does. Absolutely. Is that the sensible thing to do? I believe so, because again, the, in my opinion at least, the public policy reason to, to address pharmacare is that there are a number, a large number of people that don't have any coverage. Those are the people, we don't want them to not have their medications because they can't afford them. Those are the people, I think from a you know pure policy perspective, are the, are the target and not now trying to change the coverage for all the people that already have it. So that's the point. So let, let's, if we can, look mm -hmm. sort of a few years down the road when they may, you know, presumably have something in place. Do we assume that those who are currently covered, either through the workplace or through some mm -hmm. other private plan of their own, will just sort of keep doing that? Is that I, likely I, to be the way that, it goes? Yes, I think that's mm -hmm. likely, and I think that's now what's coming out sort of in subsequent um, you know, discussions that Morno is having with it, with the community is yes, that that's the idea. We'll just leave those status quo. They're working. I mean, they are working. I think there's opportunity in those plans to do some real, you know, behavior change in, all, in looking at options, et cetera, but they're working. So let's leave those in place and let's focus on these people that don't have coverage. Let's find out about how well they're working in as much as if the federal government were to come in, even with a modest pharmacare plan designed to only cover those who don't have coverage right now, do you think it could serve as a disincentive to private sector companies to continuing to offer as broad a suite of drugs as mm -hmm. possible to their employees? Might they say at the end of the day, well, you know what, if the feds are going to cover this anyway, why are we doing this? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think there's, this, so it, it could, however, I think what, I mean, what could be done is, um, that, you know, employers, for instance, that already offer benefit plans to their employees, that they would be essentially required to continue that, that they now just can't default to this new plan and say, no, we're not going to cover people for drugs. We'll cover them for everything else, but not drugs because we want to, them to be in this pool of people not covered. I think there's certainly, right, there's strategies that the federal government could put in place to ensure that companies aren't simply going to try to you know, offload this. If you're a new company, though, setting up business mm -hmm. after this new plan is in place, you're not caught by that obligation then, are you? Does that well, give them an advantage? Um, I mean, curiously, and I won't, I won't get sort of all the facts right, but in Quebec, for instance, they, as an employer, if you're providing a plan that includes, and again, this is the part I won't get perfectly right, but including, for instance, life insurance, et cetera, then the drug piece has to be part of this. Because if you don't have coverage, um, right, drug coverage in Quebec is mandatory. So you either get it through your employer or you get it through the government. So what they don't want to do is exactly that, is if employers now set up plans that offer benefits, but they exclude drugs, hoping it now falls mm. to the government. So I think there's strategies that they could use to really focus on, you know, employers. This is, this is truly part of a benefit plan. So don't now try to mm. shift it over here. Uh, at the risk of using uh, a controversial expression, we know Quebec is a distinct society, mm -hmm. and even if there is a national mm -hmm. pharmacare plan brought in, they're probably not going to be part of it, right? Are they probably going to keep their own plan? I, I expect they would because they have a system. I mean, there's right. There's, I'm sure there's opportunities in their own system, right, for for some uh, let's say change. But you know, the system is set up whereas Quebecers are covered either through an employer plan or picked up through the government. So we'd eventually, presumably, have a national plan that covers off nine provinces and three territories, but not the province Quebec. of Quebec. I mean, it's possible one day. I suppose, to some extent, you know, would there be money being put on the table from the federal government? It's possible they might come in. That's true. I mean, it, it could seems, be that. you know, that's an op that would be an opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're not in politics, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask you a sort of a little mm -hmm. political question here anyway, because, of course, the NDP leader federally, Jagmeet Singh, came out pretty quickly right after this idea was unveiled saying you guys stole our idea that's basically mm -hmm. our plan what you're suggesting I don't know in how much detail you've kind of surveyed what the NDP has in mind and what the Liberals have in mind do you see significant differences there so I, I admittedly I, I don't I probably haven't dug enough deeply enough into the NDB plan in terms of what they're offering but 
Um, I mean, just sort of there, sort of philosophically, I could well imagine they're looking at a plan again for people that aren't necessarily covered. Um, I don't know, you know, you know, part of it is the whole idea of pharmacare for many years now. We've been talking about pharmacare, and no one actually has ever defined it. And so I think, right, what's important, I mean, even a little bit of definition around covering people who, you know, don't have coverage, I think, is already now helpful in terms of what's the scope and what's the cost. Do you remember the first time a federal government? Pledge to bring in a pharmacare plan? I mean, I'm thinking it's decades, right? Oh, I think so. Easily. I think absolutely. And I know, um, again, when I was in government, uh, there was an initiative called the National Pharmaceutical Strategy. So that was back in 2006. That strategy was, and certainly I was sort of came in on the tail end of it. So, and I know well before that, there have been discussions about national pharmacare. Okay, in which case, given that it has been pledged by so many governments over such a lengthy period of time, why has it never happened? Mm -hmm. Well, I think partially, um, I mean, in some provinces, for instance, like the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan, that came in in, I think, the late 60s, sort of early 70s. So there, ha there have been plans put in place. So I think there are already plans that are covering you know, a certain part of the population. Mm -hmm. I suspect part of the other plan is, first of all, it is hugely complex. So when you think about it, a pharmacare is actually just a formulary. It's just a list of drugs, right? Mm -hmm. And so to our earlier discussion, in Ontario, the ODB and now OHIP Plus is working on a list of drugs that are about 4,400. Most private plans have 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 drugs on them. So there's a already there you can see the complexity because now you're you're scaling down that list of drugs. And the other side of it too is just the cost. I think the cost is you know, a significant factor in all of this and maybe politics. Maybe a little bit of politics, <laughs> maybe just a little bit, yeah. Um, let me put to you the quote that Andre Picard, the very good mm -hmm. health reporter uh, in the Globe and Mail, health columnist rather, um, <laughs> he called the announcement quote, an inkling of the possibility of action. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't think he's completely overwhelmed mm -hmm. by uh, how bold it is. Would you sign on to that, or are you prepared well, to say something different? Well, I have a different? ton of respect for Andre Picard. I think he's a, and certainly in the pharma care space, he's very, very knowledgeable. I mean, I think, um, and the language the federal government has word, an advisory council to study the options, et cetera, and strategy versus plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's really sort of underlining what Andre has said in terms of certainly this is looking at what's possible and what is the price tag for what's possible. And so I think it's, and there's also been then also notion of we're not going to change what's already working in place. So I think that's a probably a fair assessment he's made. They do say politics is the art of the possible. Possibility. So we'll see what's possible at the end of the day. Uh, Helen Stevenson, as always, good of you to come into TVO and help us out with this. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Pleasure to. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.